Isso, o weekend é o... So good morning to everyone, to everybody. So first of all, let me thank Cisco for having accepted our proposal and let me thank second place, our discussant, uh, Professor Giovanni Orsina. Uh, I spent just very few minutes for the introduction and then I, give, I will give space to Metz and then I, I take my, I, I will take the floor and our session will be followed thanks to Ettore and, and the last place, Brian. So a number of influence, influential scholars have described the 20th century as the century of ideologies. But our approach that we'll try to, to explore and to discuss thanks to this session looks at the hybridity in and between political ideologies with a focus on liberalism and democratic socialism and consider how their histories have been entangled and mutually constituted. This panel aims to investigate the 20th century history from, a new, from this particular perspective welcoming one of the most famous Tony Judd's thesis, namely the 20th century as the era of the intellectual history of politics and politicians. Its main goal is to trace contaminations and influences between liberalism and socialism in an intellectual and political history of ideology. But before focusing on themes of single papers, I think a premise is necessary. The panel is derived, derived from a larger project on the re reconstruction of the history, first of all, a political one, of the 20th century as a result, as I said, of a continuous con combination and or mutual influence between socialism and liberalism, obviously without neglecting the impact on this process generated by totalitarianism. In planning this study, which is still evolving and will and will have other moments of public discussion, we decided to divide the contemporary age into four major phases, as suggested also by the most recent historiographic literature. So pre-war, interwar, post-war, and the turning point of 70s and 80s. Within each section, individual studies will examine specific issues from a different perspective, economic one, political one, cultural and international ones. This premise is useful to make clear that this pan that our panel should be considered a true work in progress in which the papers are held together precisely in light of the, of the, scheme, of the scheme I have, or, uh, I have just outlined. The papers are focused on specific aspects of the four political, uh, four historical phases that we, we will analyze in a collective book we are working on. Me and Matt are the editor of the book. We are going, to, we are projecting and working on it. So the first will be Matt Sandren, University of Gothenburg. And Mats will discuss the circulation of economic ideas between Austria and Sweden between 19th and 20th century, which he believes to help form, to form the ideological basis of the future Scandinavian welfare state. I will deal with the possible influences of Wilsonianism in the French socialist debate between the World War I and the immediate post-war post -war period considering mainly international political issues. Hector Costa, University of Gothenburg, will illustrate the reception in the socialist international debate during the 50s of concept linked to the liberalism and Christianity. And finally, Brian Shev, Leiden University, will focus on the actual impacts of Bad Godesberg Congress of 1959 on the updating of the SPD economic policies. He is asked, Brian is asking uh, rhetoric versus substance in his paper. So we believe that this kind of exercise is extremely useful to try to reread the contemporary age beyond the fences we have traditionally given ourselves. But this is the final words of my introduction. I will give the floor to Matt. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, in, in fact, uh, many thanks to, to Jacopo. Th thanks for organizing this 
this uh, session. Thanks for taking me in. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, that you together with Brian uh, have taken me into this uh, very exciting book project. I'm looking so much forward to continue this, uh, this uh, venture together with, with, uh, with all of you. Uh, my, my paper is on a, a transfer of a specific economic idea from uh, Austria to Sweden in the uh, late uh, 19th and early 20th uh, century. Uh, it is a paper on how uh, economic ideas becomes uh, common territory for different political ideologies. Uh, it is uh, a paper on uh, a neoclassical theory of this period, and that is the early neoclassical th th theory then that we are dealing with. It is a paper on the transfer of ideas of, the, of this first Austrian school of economics uh, and how their ideas was transferred over to Sweden, economists and politicians and intellectuals in Sweden at the same time. So it is a paper on how especially the capital theory of Eugen von Böhm-Bawerk, uh, how they were transferred, uh, especially by the Swedish economist Knut Wixell over to the Swedish intellectual environment. I don't know if Eugen von Böhm-Bawerk is familiar to you. He was uh, b beside Alfred Marshall, he was the most well-known economist in these days. Uh, he's largely forgotten today. He did have some kind of on living memory uh, because uh, uh, until uh, Austria became a member of the uh, Euro, uh, they had uh, his photo on the 50 shilling note. Uh, but that is already some, some years ago, of course. Uh, so uh, th this specific theory uh, is Bambava's theory of capital interest, which focuses on the, on the work of time uh, and the rationality of capitalists. So his argument is that capital is built, created uh, by capitalists who um, has the ability, he says, to uh, not use up their utilities at once, but to keep them, let time work, perhaps put them into production and wait until the utilities thus are worth more before they put them to, to the market. Th this theory he is developing against previous theories from Smith, uh, Ricardo, uh, and also, and especially, uh, in opposition to the to Marx theory of capital rent and capital interest. Uh, Bern Bavak and his theory then is uh, pointed out not only by Knut Wixell in Sweden, but through Knut Wixell, uh, early socialists and social democrats in Sweden pick up the theory by Bern Bavak. Most uh, noteworthy is uh, Tage Erlander. And Tage Erlander is not uh, just anyone. He was the prime minister in Sweden from uh, 1946 to 1968, which is an unbeaten record among democracies. He won eight elections. The last election he stood in 1968 he, his party, the Social De Democrats, won uh, with more than 50%. So uh, I would suggest he is one of the most successful political leaders in Europe during, uh, during the, the post-war. And he pointed out that the theory, the capital theory and the economic thinking of Bern Barwerk was essential. He was the greatest economist thinker. 
And what perhaps is, is uh, a bit curious of this is that uh, Ben Bavak was not a socialist, uh, not a social democrat, uh, surely not a social democrat. He was rather uh, liberal, conservative, and perhaps more conservative than, than uh, liberal. Uh, so in, in my paper and in, my, in the draft for a chapter, I play out the, this transfer against uh, the, the, the backdrop of, uh, the, of a national comparison between Austria and Sweden. And uh, I try to do it through building a narrative when I compare these two key, key figures, uh, and just to give you a hint of how different these key figures are, uh, let, let me just point out that uh, Ben Bavak himself was an uh, aristocrat. He was born into the leading class of society. He was a high official, loyal servant of Emperor Franz Josef, he was uh, the Minister of Finance for several uh, periods around the turn of the century. He was the upholder of a hierarchic society. He looked upon society very much from, from Auburn. Uh, Vixel, on the other hand, he was uh, uh, rather a rabid, a rabid radical. He stood in the center of the radicalization of political discussions in Sweden. Uh, he was uh, not looking at society from Auburn, but rather considering himself to be educating the general public. So he argued for the, the rights of women. He argued for the use of contraceptives, very spectacular in these days. Uh, he argued for the possibility to live together uh, in a couple without being married. He did so together with, with his wife through, through all, 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 all the years together. So he was, uh, he was uh, arguing for democracy and he was especially opposed to the old so, so, society. So, uh, they had two very different positions. Still, they had greatest respect for each other. Uh, they uh, wrote to each other. They read each other's manuscripts. And then also they re reviewed their, their, their new books in, in papers. Such happened these days. Uh, but but what, what is... Uh, now I must ask you, Jacope, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Five, six, five, six minutes. Five, six minutes. Excellent. So uh, how, come, how come that Vixel then takes over these theories and they become so popular in Sweden? Well, one thing is that Bambavax somehow represents the most modern economic thinking, the most modern thinking of, of society that is found in Europe in these days. So, so that makes, makes Ben Bavak interesting for Ben Bavak and for other uh, socialist thinkers in, in Sweden. But there is also something about the very theory of Ben Bavak because in, in his capital theory, he, he's, he's arguing that there is a kind of equilibrium to be found between capital interest and labor wages. And at this equilibrium, it is um, uh, for the optimal benefit of society's economic de development to find this equilibrium. Then Ben Bavak argues that to find this, you need state, you need state intervention to, to set these factors to, together. Th then when Vixel takes over the, this th theory, he, he adds a third factor, and that is uh, land, land interest. But, but he keeps to the idea of, uh, of having, of, the, of, an, of a possible equilibrium between these three fa factors. Uh, but then, once again, he differs from Ben Bavak 
in arguing that uh, this, this equilibrium should be found through cooperation between the interest groups in, in, in Sweden. So, and, and that is why uh, th this take on the theory, one can argue that th th this is kind of uh, uh, leading into the thinking of the Swedish uh, model of, uh, of, of the welfare state. So I have, uh, I think, two minutes or, or some minutes. So let me come to my concluding four minutes. Concluding remarks. Uh, Matt, that will you be, have uh, four that, minutes. That, that will be excellent, uh, Jacopo. So my concluding remarks then is that uh, what, what we do have uh, with Ben Barvak and Knut Vixell is a case of two different alternatives for the coming European social state of the 20th century. So my, my argument is that um, by, by taking, but by taking stand from a final comparison between the protagonists of this paper, and so, sorry, I have to take the, the, this again and, uh, uh, and connect, tie into with, with my concluding re remarks. Well, the, the two alternatives for the coming European social state then, that, 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 that is something I, I want to argue. Uh, I, 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 I would like to argue that Eugen von Bernbavak, uh, he was not a utopian thinker and neither was the, the rest of the Austrian school. So by Bernbavak, we um, do not find descriptions of what a future and different society would look like. It's more accurate to call Ben Barvak a radical anti-utopian writer and thinking. According to him, he lived in a society that was the best. The foundations of the economy and the political order he thought should not be exchanged. The only possible changes were those that could correct a little bit the existing so so society. And th this is of course not surprising. The Austrian school's place and role was actually to administer Habsburg Austria. The Excel shared partly this anti-utopian attitude towards the economy. He wanted a fairer distribution of the wealth but this does not change the general attitude. He wanted more, but we, we can say he wanted more corrections than the Austrians did. The foundations of economic life were certainly there and should continue to be the same. However, however politically, he was definitely a utopian thinker. Political institutions should be democratic. So he is pleading for capitalist, economic justice and de democracy. A more important difference between Bembavec and Vixel is that while the former's ideology is shaped by paternalistic notions, the latter's is by egalitarian ones. Bembavec gives the higher officials, economists and capitalists special positions in social order. Vixel, on the other hand, raised demands such a women's franchise and the equal distribution of private fortunes. Uh, in Bambavak's ideology, state and capitalist markets are two opposing powers in society. His ideology, I would argue, was influenced by the polarity of state and capitalist markets in his society. In Mixell's ideology, we see something similar, but there is one important uh, difference. He gives the interest groups of society an intermediary function. Vixel's society is one where the interest groups cooperate. For him, parliamentary democracy will optimize that cooperation. So uh, what we have is actually uh, the, the uh, future the, the vision we find by Vixel that has much in common with the more developed uh, Swedish social state of the 1950s. 
Ben Barvak also looked, his writings could also be uh, understood as just one minute, uh, you know, a preface for a social state, however, a paternalistic social social state uh, that that would, would, would be. So um, we, we could say that in the early in the early 20th century, uh, but both a paternalistic and a more democratic uh, social state were possibilities. Uh, but in the end, uh, uh, the paternalistic uh, social state uh, did not get the upper hand, even if one can argue that there still has been some, uh, some traits of such paternalistic state uh, living on also in Swedish uh, social state. Uh, thank you, Jacopo. So thank you, Matt, for also for your the time you respected. And uh, so let's start with my paper, which is in, so following the scheme I um, previously I mentioned. So pre-war, interwar. My paper is between pre -war, between World War One and the beginning of the post-war periods because I like I will discuss the possible influences of Wilsonianism within the. Um, Europe, the French Socialist Party between 1916 and 1919. So I, I try to reach two goals thanks to my paper. The first is discussing Wilson's Wilson program's reception within the political debate of the SPIO. And the second one is examining the possible influences of the US president plans for the, for the post-war and for the new world order after the World War I on the transformation of the sphere of the spheres political program. Uh, but for um, to understand this route and this historical process, uh, we have to consider that uh, at the beginning of the century, so the Second International and the SPIO was a part of this, uh, was a political party member of the Second International. So the Second International uh, between 1907 at the Stuttgart Congress and 1912 at the Basel Congress. So all socialist parties uh, presented themselves uh, as guardians of peace. But we know that the, after the outbreak of the World War I in, uh, in summer 1914, uh, the, the history uh, went uh, to another direction. Um, I have no time here to deep to go deep into these uh, to these problems, but uh, to comprehend the possible influence of Wilson programs on this field, I think that we have to consider uh, um, the the first episode that we have to consider is when after the new election, Wilson new election on November um, nineteen sixteen, Wilson decided to launch uh, and uh, the, probably the first peace initiative. Um, when he in, on this on 18 December, uh, Wilson sent to the Triple Intent and to the Triple Alliance a note proposing that that both alliances had to consider the formation of a League of Nations uh, to ensure, ensure peace and justice for the world. Uh, but uh, so after this uh, note, the debate within the French Socialist Party. Um, was extremely influenced by the Wilson proposal. Uh, I I studied, I decided to study the reception of Wilsonianism on the sphere, uh, focusing at most on the Humanité or the popular to the most relevant journals uh, and newspapers. Sorry, of the uh, spheres uh, of the sphere, and. Uh, after the um, after the note, the humanité de declared that uh, uh, such document had to be considered extremely relevant, according to two reasons. The first one, because Wilson invoked the demand of safeguarding neutral countries' rights, and the second, the second, the purpose of establishing a new global order through the League of Nations should be supported because it aims to safeguard independence, territorial integrity, and political and economic freedom of nations. So this is the first reaction within the SPO, and the, this is the reaction of the majority of the SPO. We, we have to remember that the majority of the SPO approved the, um, 
the credit war in all between at, between the end uh, of July and the beginning of August 1914. So it's the first sign of the transformation of the politi of the sphere of position facing the war. But also, uh, and is particularly confirmed by what uh, written by a very relevant uh, uh, member of the SFIO leadership. I mean, uh, Pierre Renaudel who was one of the leader of the SFIO majority and was one of the most convinced exponent for the, about the Union Sacré. I have no time, so I, I have to go very fast to the to, for for covering the whole topic of my paper. So we have the the second episode that we have to consider the the speech, uh, the peace uh, without victory speech, which was uh, given by Wilson on uh, 22 January 1917. So after the speech, and uh, the both journals I examined. So the Humanité which represented the majority and the populaire, which represented the minority of this few, both uh, uh, reacted with in a very positive terms. A great voice, so the humanité wrote, mm, wrote, in favor of peace and for future, for, for the peace regime to be organized, for the new legal relations to be built in the world. That's the, the opinion of the humanité. And for the popular, Wilson had outlined uh, with a bold hand a general plan and socialists, uh, they, they, they wrote, uh, had to support and uh, specifying this kind of plan with their specific point of view. Uh, after this, the, the note of December 16, the, yeah, 16, and the, the speech in uh, January 17, uh, the SPIO and the member, parliament, members of parliament of the SPIO introduced a specific agenda based on three specific points. First, the SPIO warmly welcomed the admirable message of the President Wilson. Second, the concept of peace based on the free will of people and not on armed forces. Third, the majority of elected representatives accepted Wilson, President Wilson's proposals and supported the creation of a League of Nations. It's interesting from my perspective that because these uh, three points represented a transformation of the political position of the CEO facing the war before the uh, October Revolution and before the 19, at the beginning of the 1917. Uh, this perspective was confirmed after that the US decided to enter into the war uh, and after the speech given by Wilson on, two, uh, on April 2, 1917, when he justified the military intervention, um, also using democratic words and democratic uh, motivations for explaining why US decided to uh, enter into the World War I. So the slogan, make the world safe for democracy is extremely well known. And uh, also that the US uh, did not have selfish hands to serve because US people desired no conquest, no dominion, but also no indemnities or material compensation. So, that was the perspective and this per particular perspective was totally welcomed by both journals, both mm, journals I examined. So the humanité, but also for the popular. Um, moreover, we have to say that within the few, the, the, the point of the League of Nations found uh, an extremely uh, a field for the influences they perspective also because in this field this particular point of, was extremely debate um, after the beginning of the war in 1915 Edgar Milo uh, which was a very relevant exponent of the majority of this field uh, was after just after the outbreak of the war in favor of the of the uh, France in entrance into World War One. So Milo in 1915 wrote, wrote a book entitled "Not in Case La, Soci La Société des, Na des Nations." So which considered de facto with the first Wilson's first declaration in favor of an international association with the goal of preventing conflict between nations through a super uh, national mediation body. So I, I have just five minutes. I have, I, I think that I, it, it's better if I focus on the very 
final part of my paper. So the first part I want to spend a few words is the, the reaction of the sphere facing the, uh, with the 14 points, which were the, the, we can consider then the manifesto of Wilsonian per in perspective for the post-war world. And the, the, for the human, for the, for the sphere, uh, we, the, on the humanité, the sphere wrote that the 14 points had to be considered the real tool for realizing the real democratic Peace. Renaudel wrote that 14 points should be understood as the initial step of new democratic relations, formally based on public procedures and treaties, no more secret agreements, which is now the relevant aspect um, supported by Wilson. It was to, thanks to his uh, dip, uh, diplomatic initiatives during World War I. And um, Mm, the most, the two points that we, I would like to stress here with you about the 14 points, which will, are particularly two. So the first one is the self-determination and the second one, I have already mentioned the League of Nations. Let me spend a few words on the uh, self-determination concept. Uh, a very interesting uh, study produced by Mario Grazia Marigi uh, explained that this, per, this point, was already part of socialist program at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Merigi uh, um, studied the International Socialist Bureau and the permanent organization of the Second International. And uh, she illustrated that in, 19, at the in 1906, when few countries were nations without full state personality, a declaration of the International Socialist Bureau stated that nations could concede with urban agglomerations whose aspirations for autonomy and moral unity uh, as the, re the result of a long historical tradition had managed to maintain themselves despite dependence of different governments. So we can say that there was a programmatic and theoretical base that supported this uh, um, this, pro this process of uh, that make possible and um, a sort of con contamination or influences of Wilsonianism on socialist program or um, basically, namely the socialist program of the sphere. The very last part of the of the my paper. Let me discuss not only the not the the, the decline of Wilsonian nor star uh, within the socialist uh, French debate. That's happened after, the, after that the um, peace conference in Paris started. So when the, um, the result of the peace conference was a bit different between brackets to what the socialists aimed to what socially expected from such uh, episode. Uh, I mean, that was a bit different. I'm, I'm going to conclude the pres my presentation. And this is extremely impor important for me uh, because we have to consider that what French socialists and probably European socialists, uh, obviously the part of the European socialists with, which do not consider the October Revolution and the, the Leninist perspective as the perspective to follow in the Western country. So these, uh, these particular segments of the socialist movement probably add that they did not very well understood what Wilson, Wilsonian, Wil, Wilsonianism was. Uh, I, I explained this uh, this, this misunderstanding in the, very, in, the, in the final part of my paper. So we can say that also considering the League of Nations, just, just, to, just to use the League of Nations as the uh, model to comprehend this misunderstanding, we have to say that for the socialist the League of Nations has to be considered as a sort of League of Peoples. So in which elected mem in which the representation of each country has to be the elected members from each parliament or from each national parliament. But we know that for Wilson, the League of Nations and, and accordingly to the covenant of the League of Nations, so the uh, League of Nations had to be constituted by the, um, the member, the representatives of the each government and not each parliament. So this is a very different perspective followed by two, by uh, Wilson and 
Wilson and his program and socialist perspective. So we can say that this fascination has probably Mark Mazauer very well uh, wrote in his book on entitled Governing the World. So we can say that the, for socialists, the um, influences produced on their progress by Wilson was uh, de facto favored by the war and the difficulties of the second international in reacting also on programmatic terms facing the war. Uh, I finished my, my presentation, so probably I, I have no time to cover all topics I would like to explain to you, but it's time to give floor to Hector. And thanks to all. Thank you, Jacopo. Thank you, Jacopo, for your presentation. Uh, very nice. So uh, I have a PowerPoint. I'm going to share it. Uh, Uh, riesci a condividere? Uh, non lo so, non mi dice uh, apri preferenze di sistema. Uh, forse devo fare, uh, devo consentirgli di mettere la privacy. Vabbè, uh, lasciamo stare il PowerPoint. No, ma non ma... dovrebbero esserci problemi, nel senso che sei abilitato a condividerlo. Quindi... Sì. Uh, proviamo di nuovo. No, devo dovrei riavviare il Dovrei riavviare Zoom, lasciamo perdere, parlo braccio. Ok, uh, thank you. So let's uh, drop this uh, minor inconvenient and uh, let's go back to the um, presentation. So in my, in my paper, I discussed uh, the issue of, um, is of, uh, um, in his, of history writing by socialists, which I have argued that is an important uh, tool for leadership. And this was best expressed by Tony Blair arguing that uh, we must learn from history rather than being chained to it, which expressed a desire of the leadership to use uh, the history as a way to legitimize uh, strategic moves and policies and to widen the appeal of the party. And um, I argue that uh, socialists have always used the, the connection to liberalism, ethics, and religion as a way to, to, uh, to uh, expand the appeal of um, to expand the appeal of socialism. However, it was also a move within socialism. It was a way through which some section of uh, socialism, especially the uh, more moderate and reformist wanted to, to drive the evolution of socialism toward a certain direction and to capture a new group such as the middle classes. This is why the, te the tendency to emphasize a connection to Christianity and liberalism has been met with resistance by purists like Anirin Bevan, but also by the scorn of historians who tend to be uh, often uh, suspicious of a reformist leader of the socialist parties. So the goal of my paper is to explore a book prepared by the Socialist International on the history of socialism. Uh, this book was conceived in the early 50s and uh, it, I argue that an important part of this book was how the socialists framed their connection to liberalism and Christianity. And um, and I argue that an important part was a sort of uh, balance between two aspects, hybridity and continuity. On the uh, hybrid continuity on one hand and opposition and evolutionary leap on the other. On the one hand, the socialists try to stress the connection between the socialism and liberalism and Christianity. So they, that they belong to the, same, uh, uh, to the same realm of ideals. On the other hand, they wanted to stress that socialism was superior so it was uh, the next stage of evolution, and the ad, and so in the, it, um, so there was also a break with the past. 
So uh, this was best uh, uh, emphasized by Edward Bernstein in uh, his uh, seminal book of socialist revisionism, in which he defined the relationship with liberalism. He argued that the socialism was the true era of liberalism because it continues the revolutionary ideal, the, the popular participation, and it actually realized the ideals of liberalism in practice. As liberalism had eliminated legal oppression and feudalism, socialism would uh, eliminate economic oppression. And as Stefan Berger argued, this was a form of weak historiography tinted red. And uh, they, they could do this by stressing the contrast between true liberalism, the liberalism of the past and the socialist, and the economic liberalism, the liberalism of free market and, um, <coughs> and individualism. Now, my focus is on the socialist international as a specific, uh, as a specific uh, field of, uh, um, uh, uh, as a specific uh, subject of study. This has been at the center of my research for years. Uh, this, can you see now the PowerPoint? Yes, everything's fine. Oh, good. Now it's... Now it works. Uh, okay, uh, so I was uh, I was saying yes, uh, yes. So the socialist international. Uh, I argue that the socialist internationalism did not end in nineteen fourteen, but it was an, a key part on the for the. European socialist even in the post-war period because it allowed the socialists to exchange a year and coordinate voluntarily. It also allowed them to build a common ideology that took the place forming the, their declaration of principles, the Frankfurt Declaration. And it was what I call the internationalization of domestic quarrels, meaning that, uh, social, meaning that uh, uh, socialist, um, a socialist faction could ally with another faction from another party, and the, the, the factional struggle in one party could stimulate factional struggle in another party. And uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, the Socialist International had a major role in developing the ideology of social democracy. First, in the 1948, with the anti communist turn, the Socialist International uh, set the term of anti-communism as a basic foundation of the social democratic ideology, also defining an alliance to parliamentary democracy. Then with the Copenhagen conference in June 1950, there was a debate on the democratic basis of socialism, which, uh, saw, uh, which uh, saw an attempt to define socialism in a more positive term, and uh, which, was, uh, which found expression in 1951 with the Frankfurt Congress, and the Declaration of Principle of the Socialist International, the Frankfurt Declaration. And uh, this was also developed uh, later with the, uh, with the uh, uh, creation of a book on the ideological development of democratic socialism. This uh, book was, an attempt, was proposed uh, by the Socialist International in 1952, in 1951, and was supposed to come out in 1952. The idea was that uh, each uh, party should have described the ideological evolution of their uh, ideas in their own country and uh, explain uh, them for the international audience, uh, describing how they had interacted with other developments. And it was a very selection of writers that I have listed here. It, it, uh, it was supposed to have, uh, all, to have all the big parties in Europe but the book met a great obstacle from the beginning because uh, almost everyone was late to deliver their paper and that it was an, and uh, some did not even send it at all. And this created a great um, frustration for the editor, Julius Brown, the secretary of the Socialist International. Finally, in 1955, the Socialist International abandoned the project, but it was picked up in Germany by the publisher G.H. Ditz, tied to the SPD, and in Italy by the Alessandro Schiavi and Opera Nuove, the uh, publishing house of the Italian Democratic Socialist Party. So uh, this uh, debate goes back to 1950, the Copenhagen debate on socialism, Marxism, and liberalism. 
uh, which saw the, the French socialist try to define uh, socialism in the connection to uh, Marxism as a, a, a condition that could, not, uh, that could not be renounced without giving up uh, uh, socialism itself. And this met the resentment of the, of the Nordic social democrats, particularly Alsing Andersen from Denmark and the already mentioned Tager Lander. Who they argued that they supported democracy at the ultimate end, but this meant a social democracy, not just liberal democracy. And they, for the, to achieve this, it was still necessary to achieve a public control over the economy and not just economic liberalism. So the uh, Frankfurt Declaration was based on an harmonization of freedom and planning, but it was also based on a Hegelian vision of history where socialism was a dialectic. Uh, a uh, struggle between uh, the aspiration of uh, um, between uh, the aspiration towards state intervention and the aspiration toward individual freedom. We could degenerate. Right. I'm sorry, five minutes. Just five minutes. Okay, we could uh, degenerate either in uh, the um, either in um, uh, free market economy or in uh, the state state bureaucratic socialism. So um, what they wanted was uh, was the synthesis of um, what synthesis of the two would, would uh, realize the re the real trajectory of liberalism as the, the Norwegian Paul Felster argued. So uh, they all this writer, uh, all this writer tried to frame their national histories in this term. Uh, this is, was um, uh, this there was some difference. For example, Valiani and Elster tried to recovered the liberal tradition of their own country, while the German Frey insisted it was the weakness of German liberalism that, that produced Marxism in the, German, in the German labor movement. Order did not really cover this topic like the French Texier and Benedict Kapsky. So uh, Christianity was also a major uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's well known that Morgan Phillips uh, the secretary of the Labour Party said that the Labour Party owed more to Methodist than to Marxism, and that this was a major point in the in the Declaration of Principle. But it was also developed further by the Dutch Labour Party and the Socialist International and Benteveld Conference. The, in the book, there is an important essay by Willem Banning, who had worked with the Dutch Labour Party to have the party open to religious people. And he had argued that it was important to overcome the continental hostility between the religion, socialism and the churches. And for this, it was necessary to end the socialism as a comprehensive worldview and turn it into a movement of actual people and a concrete prog program to be realized. And, uh, in, on the, um, and this also required changes in Christianity. And, but also there were other socialists like the Indian socialist Acharya Neredra who also saw socialism as a, a synthesis of all the best religion and uh, that, that could form uh, the, the ideas of the future. So um, to conclude them, uh, I have, um, think that the book shows that uh, what the intent of uh, Julius Brauntal was right, that it was uh, necessary to stress the plurality of socialism in history based on the same universal values. Brauntal insisted on this point that despite all their difference and the division, there was still an eternal socialist ideal that could inspire the action of people in very different contexts. And indeed, according to many socialists and to William Benning, the, the ideal of socialism was nothing less than the ideal of Western civilization, of Christianity, that were becoming a concrete in the form of socialism. So um, we see here the connection with liberalism and Christianity was not just to the specific uh, ide political ideologies, but they were tied to the very idea of uh, European civilization and Western modernity, to which uh, the socialism laid a claim on. So for this reason, I argued that the um, expansion of socialism in the form of uh, laying claim on other ideological families was not done as a position of weaknesses to dilute the idea of uh, the ideas of socialism, but as a position of strength to lay claim on the very essence of a European civilization, on the, the very nature of uh, um, of the very nature of culture and common sense. So 
it was truly an hegemonic claim in the Gramscian sense. And um, for this reason, I think that we should reconsider what the historians have said about uh, the ideological division of social in the post-war period and see it as a, as a, as a power move, not a weak move. On, on the other end, this does not mean to judge further uh, ideological evolution like the Blair movement, because they have to consider it in their own context and in the position in which they were first created. So that's it. Thank you. Many thanks, Hector, for your presentation and uh, for every expected time. So I give the floor to Brian. Uh, and I'm also using a, a PowerPoint. If I do share screen, should it, should it work? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're allowed to show your screen, so no problems. Oh, excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, and, and thanks for everybody here and to, to Cisco and, uh, and Jacopo, my colleagues, and uh, Professor Asina. Really appreciate the, the opportunity. Uh, so hopefully this is working. It's working, yeah? Yeah. All right, great. Uh, so um, my uh, presentation is on uh, Bad Goodisberg uh, and uh, reconsidering uh, the relationship between Bad Goodisberg and um, economic uh, liberalism in, in effect. I'm taking the, the, the economic approach. Uh, the paper is rather uh, experimental as is the, the, the presentation. Um, I come from the perspective where I tend to, uh, my, my research is focused on uh, the history of public policy and political parties. Uh, so I'm looking for, for policies for, you know, what, what is actually changing in terms of uh, bills they're presenting in the, in the Bundestag, positions they take on European integration, uh, et, et cetera. So I'm going to take, um, see how it looks to take a public policy uh, perspective on um, uh, the economic uh, modernization or economic policy of the SPD uh, in, in the post-war period. Uh, just a quick uh, summary. Most people are probably familiar with the Bad Goodisberg uh, platform in, in abstract, but I'll, I'll lay out some of the key features so we put them on the table. Uh, it basically announced the party now to be a cross-class people's party. Uh, it famously did not mention uh, Karl Marx, uh, though it also doesn't really mention anybody else, so that's something else to, to keep in mind. Uh, it, it represents a, a clear opening to Christianity and, and religion, which falls nicely on the uh, on um, uh, uh, Ettore's uh, presentation. Uh, you have um, support for small and medium enterprises where the party had uh, been actually ambiguous on this throughout its history since it's the initial discussions uh, in, in the 1890s um, leading up to Bernstein and the, the, the religionist debate. Uh, for, for economic policy, particularly important is the displacement of socialization as a, as a principle. Actually, the party had gone back and forth on this as well to, to a large extent, um, but it maintains socialization as a, as a tool when necessary is basically the, the policy. Um, and you have the famous formulation by Carl Schiller, which is taken to, uh, in effect, as a stand-in for the uh, economic change of the SPD, uh, which is as much competition as possible, as much planning as possible, as necessary, excuse me. But as I'll point out uh, the importance of in, in a moment, uh, Schiller was not particularly involved in the development of the party's uh, competition policy. Uh, so I'm fitting this into uh, recent changes in the historiography of, of Bad Goodisberg. Uh, and of particular importance is, a, is a, um, basically a short book by Masaki Yasunu. Uh, the older literature said that uh, reformers uh, defeated the traditional party leadership, defeated the, the Marxists in effect, including the general secretary, uh, Eric, Eric Olenauer, who was a uh, in effect, uh, the quintessential traditionalist within, within the SPD. Uh, so it represented in this way a victory of, of course, of the, of the right. Uh, Yasuno did a, um, dived into the archives on the formulation of the Bad Goodisberg platform and, and argued that um, actually the most influential figure was Eric Olenhauer. Uh, so you wind up in, if you accept this argument, you wind up with the paradox that the traditionalist is the one pushing the, the reformist platform, right? Uh, this was picked up by Karen Fertig, uh, who just published a book this, this year, uh, in which um, he, picks, he picks up Yasuda's point and says that, uh, in a way, completes the argument by saying that this was represented, in effect, the public relations exercise. Marx was removed in large part because uh, Olin Howard did not want uh, to confuse people, you know, with all these figures and all this history, and he wanted sort of, so it was framed as a, in effect, as a popularization exercise. 
Uh, and um, also the Bagotisberg uh, legacy within the SPD was contested. It was claimed also by the left as well as the right uh, until in effect you have the victory of the right over the memory, right, of the uh, uh, historical memory and narrative of the Bagotisberg platform in, in the 1970s. So it's a post facto uh, uh, interpretation in effect that's been read backwards this, if we follow this argumentation. So I wanna see how this plays out if we take, and um, here's kind of the experimental feature because usually I work more inductively, uh, but uh, uh, I'm trying to tackle this from a, from a new angle. Uh, well, what are the major economic policies that we could look for there to be changes in relation to economic liberalism, right? Uh, that are either captured within the Bad Goodisburg platform, or if we take Bad Goodisburg as a, as a metaphor for the larger modernization of the SPD, uh, in the 1950s and, and early 1960s. Uh, and um, what we find is actually things, uh, you know, don't change all that all that much. Um, the SPD, and here's kind of a key argument, it might sound obvious, but I'm gonna try to hammer it uh, through, is the SPD was always a liberal party uh, in many key features of its economic policies. I mean, going back to the late 19th century uh, in, in large effect, and it was always not a liberal party. So depending on the, the fields, and you have consistency generally within the fields in which it was liberal and which it was not liberal. On external trade, the SPD was the most liberal party uh, through uh, modern German history, uh, at least up to uh, the 1960s. Uh, on European integration, the party's position uh, changed on this precise, it, it didn't change on the economic utility of European integration. Uh, it evolved due to, due to other factors, but in effect, the, they always supported a, a customs union and a common market. They were the first party to uh, call for a European cost, customs union in the party platform in the Heidelberg program of 1925. Uh, so uh, they already lifted the United States of Europe. On agriculture, the party is also a liberal party. Uh, this is tied in with external trade and constituency pressures. Uh, no, no change there, uh, though they're rather pragmatic on the issue. And then in the next three, you find that they are uh, not a liberal party. Uh, so industrializations, they don't change their position in terms of uh, trying to create either tripartism or uh, getting uh, workers on the supervisory boards right in the, in the Mitbestimmung uh, system. Uh, welfare pol policy, you don't see any noticeable changes um, uh, in, in regards to uh, what might be considered economic liberalism. This is the heyday of welfare, of course, right? Uh, when we're in the late uh, 50s, uh, into the 60s. Uh, a macroeconomic policy, the uh, party is evolving in a Keynesian direction, and we can, uh, that, that could be a debate, is that liberalism, or it's a, it's a strain of liberalism, but it's the interventionist strain of liberalism, right? Uh, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, I haven't decided how to incorporate or whether to incorporate fiscal or monetary policy. I would imagine on fiscal policy, they're not liberal, uh, and on monetary policy, um, they're probably relatively orthodox, right? Uh, so that could we might split again, and then we wind up with four policy fields where they're liberal and four where they're not, right, in terms of key uh, economic sectors. And then the crucial change, and this is why I underline it, uh, the only major change you, you see in terms of, you know, top order economic policies uh, is on cartel and competition policy in which the party evolves from a rather ambiguous but leaning towards pro-cartel policy for a specific set of reasons towards actually the most um, anti-cartel uh, party within post-war German politics, uh, which they maintained from the mid 50s until uh, the 1970s when they, they passed Europe's first, the, the Willy Braun government passes Europe's first merger control bill. Uh, so for this reason, I'm looking at, uh, in this presentation, cartel and competition policy as a way as a test case of, uh, can we see this as a evolution towards economic liberalism which is uh, usually taken to be the clay case. And, and Martin Kochner uh, argued this in relation to the SPD, that it's turned towards um, a competition policy, towards a strong competition policy, was representative of its turn towards neoliberalism. So this is kind of you know, the setting in which I'm uh, arguing, arguing against. Uh, the person who wrote the economic section of the Bad Goodsburg platform, it changed a bit over time, but in the end, the, the final person was, was Heinrich Deist. Uh, who is uh, extremely important and probably would have been the economics minister of uh, under um, the Grand Coalition, except that he, he died in a car accident in, in 1964. Uh, so he was in a way Carl Schiller's main um, uh, competitor uh, in terms of economic policy. 
Uh, and here you see he was involved already. Um, he's a figure who's very important within the early European parliament, as well as within the Bundestag, where he becomes vice president. Uh, and um, also in the SPD's internal, he, he's uh, the head of the economics uh, committee under the, the central committee. So he's, he's basically everywhere uh, when you come from 1955 to, to 1964. Brian, Brian I'm yeah. sorry, just five minutes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, what I have here is this is um, uh, actually from, from his archive. Uh, he's already laying out an anti-cartel position within the European Parliament uh, and arguing that they have a stronger position than the high authority. Uh, and he takes this um, both with it, between um, the German domestic politics and, and the European sphere. Uh, so here you have um, a quote from Heinrich Deist uh, in 1958, uh, as uh, you're moving towards the Bad Gettysburg platform, in which you see the, in a sense, essence of his position on cartel and competition policy. He's arguing for giving the high authority a stronger influence. He will also be arguing for giving the German government the higher influence, a, a politicized idea of competition, which is contrary to a liberal idea. The liberals want, um, well, the liberals are split. The liberals either want no competition policy because they're in effect allied with big business if you take the liberal party of, of Germany, uh, or they want it to be done by the courts. Uh, and entirely by the courts, and that this be laid out very, very strictly within the law, what is allowed and what is not, uh, and that um, this, is, this is what's called the order liberal position, right? A strong Rechstadt, a strong legal state. Uh, he talks about uh, public services and directing organs to replace private cartels. So Deist is actually the person who's arguing most for the removal of socialization from the platform, but he's extremely insistent on the term public control, and you wind up with these kind of uh, in-between types uh, systems where you have an element of public control, uh, as which is actually based in large part on the model of the high authority. So you see in the debates in the early 60s within the SPD, uh, the, in the um, economics uh, committee of the central committee, uh, references to using the high authority as a model for what um, uh, a domestic competition policy should, should also look like, an interventionist, um, uh, uh, competition policy, which would be linked to investment policy. Uh, and he, this has a humanist dimension, so it establishes relations of subordination of man to man, he says, right? This is not just an economic issue. The SPD links it very strongly to a demo, uh, democratizing discourse, right? Um, yeah. Uh, competition policy in the Bad Gettysburg platform, uh, you have the removal of socialization uh, as a principle, but it's maintained as a tool. And something I argue, um, I'm going to be arguing in general, is uh, the socialist socialization policy of the SPD was formulated about the coal industry, right? In particular, in 1918, 1919, uh, it was about coal, and then it was sort of generalized, right, within ideological perspectives. Though the party abandoned socialization as a principle, um, they, they, in effect, socialized the coal industry in 1968, 1969. So you do see a fruition of their policy in the context, of course, of the economic recession and crisis. The purposes of social democratic policy. Um, I'm going a little bit quick because I, I know I'm uh, uh, running out of time. Uh, this is not liberalism in my perspective. There's liberal aspects, except this is, you know, just because you have a portion that the liberals support doesn't mean uh, that it's intrinsically liberal. To protect consumers, uh, protect democracy, this is a strong discourse, right, against accumulations of economic power. They take uh, John Galbraith's, so here we have a uh, interesting relation with a left-wing liberal, but it's in the United States, so that means he's kind of a new dealer, right? Um, so we see also the, the linguistic issues that arise, right, in terms of thinking about uh, liberalism. Uh, support countervailing power. So you need to have a, a system in which large businesses, or especially multinationals, will be contested socially and economically within the domestic sphere, not just by the government, but also by the government. So here you see it, um, uh, the economic tool of investment policy. And also for the most part, social democratic policy does not apply to public enterprises. Uh, and that is um, also taken up within the merger bill passed by Billy Brandt in the 1970s. There's a direct link between these policies uh, that are formulated in the 1950s by Heinrich Deist uh, and uh, the eventual passage of the merger bill by Billy Brandt. And this is something I'm arguing uh, also in a different context. A lot of the um, materials that I use come from the internal economic discussions of economic experts uh, in the in the central committee uh, with the chair of you know usually of, uh, of Deist. Uh, so you see uh, Carl Schiller and, and Weiser, people who are involved also in the formulation of the economic section 
of the Bad Gettysburg platform because Weiser was originally the author of the economic section. Uh, and this is my, my uh, basically sum up, right? This in the next slide, I'll try to do it very quickly. Uh, I'm gonna focus just on one discussion, right? Um, in, in 1963 within that committee is from the source you just saw. Uh, and it's um, a very, the thing is, what I want the paper to eventually about, be about is how they're discussing liberalism in relation to their own policy. So how they construct their policy in part in contrast to liberalism. Uh, and I was investigating this about European integration because they, they wind up uh, in a contest with the Labour Party, uh, where the Labour Party says that, um, oh, the, the European common market, that is liberalism on steroids. Uh, and then the, the, the SPD and others counter that um, actually a free trade area would be liberalism on steroids. And this, a common market allows for uh, interventionist, um, uh, in interventions by a um, commission, right? By, a, by a, uh, an, an executive. Uh, and so we see this in this discussion, uh, Kurlbaum, who's number two in the economic, he's the head of the SPD on the economics committee of the Bundestag, uh, says an absolute maximization of competition is not at all our goal. And that would be the order liberal position. Competition for competition's sake is intrinsically good. And then we have Deist. He calls explicitly, he says, this is um, a competition policy is a tool in effect in order to create an ordering of the market. Uh, and that's an old idea going back to uh, Hilferding, uh, economics expert, and is also taken up in other parties uh, in, in Europe. But the idea of an ordering of the market um, is, is clearly not a liberal idea. Uh, and then you also have um, other uh, um, comments on this. Uh, so also from Weiser saying that competition is not a dogma or, or a taboo. And Weiser was considered the leading liberal in effect actually within the SPD's economic uh, uh, policy. So this is the sum up very quickly. Um, social democratic competition policy has been equated with neoliberalism. This is not convincing because it has a strong, it, the, the merger bill allows um, the economics minister to overrule uh, the courts to, to allow an exception. Uh, so you have an explicit uh, politicized function built into the law, uh, as well as the exclusion of public enterprises. So it's only really from the 1980s that you start to see competition policy really attacking public enterprises also at the European level, which is I think when uh, probably um, uh, competition policy became most heavily associated with the liberal position. Uh, though you had the order liberals kind of um, winning the intellectual argument in that respect in the 1950s. Um, these are other things I mentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, so my broad conclusion, you know, if you take that, if you accept the premise that it's only a change, a significant uh, change or transformation in cartel and competition policy, and you also follow my argument that um, uh, this was not a liberal shift or was not conceived as a liberal shift. Rather, it's more if you're not going to socialize, and this is in the context of really um, dealing with Hayek uh, rhetoric, right, which is very damaging for the SPD. So this would fit into the public relations uh, aspect that they needed to get rid of the idea of a, that they were a party that wanted a Zwangswirtschaft, a command economy. Uh, then what are you going to do, right? I mean, you're going to regulate, right? You're going to regulate competition. That's, that's what, what's left. And it's also a bit strange that regulation has become to be seen as liberal, right, in the context of competition policy. So this is something else I would, I would like to play with. And you do not see um, a, a direct connection uh, between Bad Gottesburg uh, and, and major changes, uh, at least in a direct sense, from, from the Bad Gottesburg uh, platform. So I would uh, follow the uh, recent historiography and, and add this economics uh, analysis. I uh, think thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. And I will give the immediately give the floor to Professor Osina for his comments. Okay. All right. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, these were all very interesting papers, and I, I very much appreciated being obliged to read them and think about them. And uh, uh, well, I'm I'm very interested in in this kind of enterprise. I'm very interested in the kind of approach you're having. Uh, I've never really studied socialism, but I've given a few thoughts in my life about liberalism, and I've always been very interested about ideologies, how ideologies uh, uh, interact with each other, and uh, how they interact with the with politics, with the the political needs and uh, the political strategies. So ideology is not not just per se, but as instruments in the political struggle, and how they are bent 
uh, towards political goals. So uh, I, am, I feel very sympathetic uh, intellectually and methodologically with the general enterprise you have undertaken. Uh, and I totally, uh, let's say, I'm totally with it. I think this would be a very interesting project, very interesting approach, and it could be very, very fruitful. Um, my first, um, I wouldn't say critical comment, but uh, I mean, the contribution I can try and give uh, to this debate uh, is about the object uh, of the enterprise. Um, why is that? Because um, basically you are comparing two objects that you do not define. So you're basically saying, you know, we want to see how a socialist ideology uh, interacts with liberal ideology, but you never give, none, none of you does, uh, a, a definition of what is liberalism and what is socialism. Uh, and the basic result is that you are studying the interaction of two objects that are not defined. And, and this makes it very complicated for the external reader to say, oh, what are they talking about? Uh, what is exactly the focus? What is the, the centerpiece? What is the, uh, the central element of this analysis? Uh, and of course, why, why don't you, uh, for instance, in, in, the, in, the, in, in the fourth paper, in Brian's paper, you get in the paper very often the question, is this liberalism? Uh, does this really belong to liberalism? What are we talking about? Should I consider also this or that element? Is this considered a liberal or a socialist approach? And of course, this is uh, exactly because you do not define and you do not define liberalism and socialism. Uh, because of course, uh, you, uh, because if you define that, then you, you, you basically you tie your hands and any definition would be open to debate. And any definition would be uh, open to criticism. And you would end up in a way to have a very highly constructed object. So you first you construct an ideal type, ideal type of liberalism. Then you construct an ideal type of socialism. And you all of a sudden discover that these two ideal types had a lot of overlap. And uh, uh, one could argue, well, of course they do. Uh, the ideal types in the beginning were very arbitrary. Uh, so my suggestion is that you uh, take as a focus the political dimension, because this would be the way to get out of this dead end and without having the problem of defining liberalism and socialism that being done by historians, you know, I, I don't like it when historians enter into the thing. This is not what we do. We normally consider empirical things. We use definitions. But uh, we, I, I think we should try not to get uh, too much uh, tied up by definition. So my suggestion is that why don't you focus on socialist subjects, historical socialist subjects, the SPD, the SVO, uh, Socialist International, uh, the uh, Swedish Social Democrats. So. The, the question in that case would be, OK, how do socialist political subjects define themselves, uh, define their own uh, ideologies, and to what extent they are using tools from other ideologies or tools that are marginal to socialist ideology uh, to build their own political discourse? I think this would give your enterprise a much clearer historical focus. My focus is not an ideology that is an intellectual construct. It's an actual historical subject, or better, a number of actual historical subjects that are, uh, let's say, uh, tied together by the fact that they all define themselves socialist or social democrats, but they all belong to the political family of socialism. Um, also because, uh, uh, and, and that's another element that uh, I, I'm, I'm, I would like to focus uh, about your enterprise. Uh, we all know that, it, I mean, you, we all deal mostly with the 
uh, the, the 20th century or late 19th century, but we all know that uh, socialism during the 19th century uh, as a very, very complicated genealogy and its genealogy has a lot to do with radicalism. Uh, now, of course, uh, the reconstruction of, of the socialist genealogy in the 50s and 60s, I think, thinking about uh, the Italian historiographical tradition, of course, socialists in the 50s and 60s were tending to forget the relationship between socialism and radicalism at their origins and trying to argue we, we are a Marxist party and to give more importance to the Marxist roots uh, of socialism. But uh, as a matter of fact, the socialism, uh, it, it was an attempt, it was an historical effort by Marxism to insulate socialism from humanitarianism, uh, religious socialism, cooperativism, anarchism, uh, democracy, uh, and, and whatever not. I mean, Italian socialism was not, Turati was, was far more a positivist than a Marxist and uh, had, had a lot in common with uh, left-wing Democrats, uh, far more than with, with Orthodox Marxists. So, uh, so basically when you, and this again shows up through the papers, very often when you're saying socialists are using liberal tools, as a matter of fact, they are using socialist tools. <laughs> they were using parts of the socialist tradition that were in a way cut off or forgotten uh, in the attempt of socialism to find an identity, to insulate itself from the democratic tradition. And again, this is because uh, ideologies are not clear cut things. I mean, uh, uh, is there freedom? I mean, I mean, thinking about Michael Frieden's reflections, uh, important reflections on ideology, is freedom a crucial element in socialism? Of course it is. Is equality a crucial element in liberalism? Of course it is. Only in the constellation of concepts, liberty has a different position in socialism than in liberalism, and equality is a different position in socialism than in liberalism, but they both belong to. And so they, they, they're so very often when you say liberals were speaking with the religious tradition, were speaking with the liberal tradition. As a matter of fact, they were speaking with their own tradition, just giving a different weight to their own tradition, traditions that had been in a way forgotten or appropriated by other ideologies or were in common with other, uh, with other ideologies. Uh, so this is my, my, general, uh, my general remark. Um, uh, uh, so uh, maybe you know picking an historical political object rather than an ideological object and uh, uh, paying more attention to the genealogy uh, that in, in in some ways in your paper sometimes get, gets lost uh, in your argument. Uh, very short comments on the on the individual papers. Uh, Matz's paper is, uh, uh, I believe, the uh, the more eccentric because it's it's for uh, is is, is uh, more centered on, on on the intellectual history. Of course, uh, the, the political part is also taken into account, but is more to the back, to the background. So, if you accept my, my my suggestion, of course, which is of course entirely up to you, uh, I would suggest that this paper be more geared towards the political side. So how do the Swedish Social Democrats uh, use uh, Ben Barracks and, and, and the, say the marginal revolution uh, rather than more uh, uh, a focus on big cell and on the intellectual exchange uh, between the two, uh, the two um, uh, intellectuals. By the way, it was all, uh, it, it was very interesting uh, how the, the thing was, uh, was deployed. Uh, there is a lot to say, I believe, about the, the matter of technocracy, of economic technocracy, and how both a democratic state and a paternalist state uh, enter into dialogue with technocracy, and, and that is also, I think, and, and how also a Democrat, uh, a right radical can be, uh, eventually, 
uh, a technocrat. And just a very small, very brief remark, you know, this idea that um, uh, there is no utopianism in Boom Baverk uh, re has reminded me of a comment, a criticism that Michael Oakeshott uh, was actually targeting to uh, Friedrich von Hayek, saying that uh, you bloody you bloody free market liberals are utopian after all. As a conservative, Oakeshott was criticizing the excessive utopianism uh, of, of the Austrian school. Of course, Ben, ben Baverk is not Hayek, but it's history. And just, you know, the question to, to what extent there is a hidden utopianism in Ben Baverk, a kind of perfect arrangement uh, that, is, that is utopian in its own, uh, in its own way. Um, uh, Jacopo, um, uh, again, uh, genealogy, uh, to what extent this view was actually, you know, reaching to its, its own roots when entering into a dialogue uh, with Wilson? Uh, so to what extent this was something that was, you know, getting back, uh, speaking with Wilson, but in a way speaking, let's say beyond Wilson with itself, uh, with its own, uh, with its own historical, uh, historical roots. Uh, it's, it's a question I would like, uh, I would like to ask you. And uh, to what extent were they aware of the fact that there was a lot of possibility of dialogue between the, the two kind of utopianisms but bottom line, Wilson's was a liberal utopian move. It was centered on free trade and on the market. So you could have a lot of dialogue on cosmopolitanism and international cooperation, but when it came to economic models, not just to the issue of colonialism, that you introduce in the conclusion a bit out of the blue, I must say. So in the conclusion, this issue of colonialism gets up, but it, it, it was not really developed in the paper. But I am more interested in uh, to what extent were they aware of the fact that that was bottom line, a liberal economic model. Um, uh, Ettore uh, also, again, all, all these papers, as I said, are very, are very, uh, very interesting. And um, no, it's interesting, this issue of hegemony and dilution. So, uh, and of also the, the comparison between the 1950s and the 1990s, which in my opinion cannot be really done for the reason that you explained in, in the introduction. This is a different period of history. So uh, the comparison, you say that uh, yourself, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Professor Rossina, just two, a couple of minutes. Yes, but I, yeah, I, I'll, yeah. I'll finish up in, in two minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you open up a dialogue with other ideologies, you try and steal the steam and the roots of other ideologies. Uh, to what extent this is uh, done out of your strength? To what extent this is showing your weakness? Now, this is, I think, very interesting when you are speaking about the, the political usage of ideologies. That is very interesting to see to what extent this is an hegemonic move, to what extent this is a self-defeating move. I, I share your opinion that in the 50s and 60s, this is, this is an hegemonic move on the part of the socialists, but to what extent in the long run, this can become uh, self-defeating. Uh, and finally, uh, Brian also has a very interesting point, and I'll, I'll say it in just one minute, uh, which is the relationship between reality and representation because uh, I, I don't know enough about but Godesberg and the SPD, but you are convincing uh, when you explain to what extent the actual economic policy of the SPD did not ch change very much with but Godesberg, but the representation changed dramatically. And uh, the comparison with Italian socialists and French socialists, of course, makes this change even clearer. I mean, this was a move of communication but that was a very important and effective move of communication. So reality did not change, but representation did change. And 
to what extent is representation not reality <laughs> in politics? That, that, of course, is a major question mark. OK, Jacopo, I leave you the floor. Oh, thanks, Professor Rossina. Uh, let me spend just a few words about general comments. Uh, I think that what you said is extremely relevant for our project because uh, when i was uh, listening our presentation mine for example but also brian and also actually so we were mentioning uh, um, members or exponents of former socialist tradition so i mentioned for example what uh, the international Socialist bureau declared in at the beginning of the 20th century and so between Will's connection on Wilsonian, for example, uh, Brian, if we were a member, I mentioned Rudolf Hilferding, so as another member of the socialist tradition. So Hattori uh, referred himself to the Leo Valiani and what uh, the socialist or the Italian socialist tradition studied and discussed be be before his uh, period. So probably what you said is extremely interesting, also the, this kind of genealogy and so the idea of uh, re-study uh, socialist history from another perspective, not only, but it's just what, what I'm, this what, uh, what is in my mind. So not just focusing on the connections, but also when a socialist tradition uh, had contact with other political traditions. So for example, liberalism or, or in my case, Wilsonianism, and you currently mentioned the economic side of Wilsonianism that uh, it totally never, for socialists, there, there was totally no relevant. They would just focus on international perspective and so on. So that's uh, what I would say. And uh, I think that uh, what you said to us will be extremely useful to improve and to make more solid our project. If Marco agrees, I think that we have just uh, three minutes before finishing our session. So even, even four or five, but no longer than that. Okay, okay, okay. So if there are comments uh, for, from my colleagues uh, or if there are questions from people that we have to worry are here uh, for um, our panel, so. Now, of course, anybody in the audience can raise their hands and, and or write in the chat the question and, and we, we will allow you to open your mic and ask the question yourselves. So there's Matt Sandra and there is something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. Uh, these were very good things to, for us to think about uh, and con continue to think about. Uh, I, I would actually ask uh, Brian, as, as, you, as you and Jacopo are working on the volume, uh, I, I think if, 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 I mean, the, the, these issues by Orsina, the, the, they, will, the, they will have to be uh, directed to within an introduction so, so, so oh, i yes. was very curious of your uh, of your reflections uh, brian on this. Um, yeah if i could jump in also uh, um i was just checking if anybody from the from the crowd uh so um th th in a way you came right to the, the the heart of this and also where i was initially um not reluctant, but initially cautious about, about the idea because I'm not used to dealing with uh, ideology in effect, right, uh, as, the, um, as the major factor. I think we're going to have to break down what liberalism is, right? Um, as, as you heard, some of what the way I was using it was somewhat historiographically in the fact that people have post facto defined or, con or conceptualized what happened as, as liberalization. So that's, that's one, is historiographical. Another would be kind of, you know, direct engagement, the socialists with what they consider to be liberal ideas. Uh, and um, they call it, it somewhat confusingly, they use the word neoliberal a lot in the early 60s, the, the socialists. Uh, and I'm trying to um, unpack what that means, right? And then you also have cooperation and in effect sort of a, dialog a, a dialectical uh, evolution with actual liberal parties, right? Uh, so I think I think first we need to define, and, and this is where your political sense, um, your your suggestion of uh, defining that our object in effect is social democratic parties, so the political right in effect, and then we can look at um, different types of engagement with liberalism as well as the historiographical. But it has to be laid out, um, and Mats is right, and, and Professor Orsina, uh, we have to lay this out very clearly in the introduction and also in the chapters. We're going to have to encourage authors to. Um, uh, define how they are uh, treating liberalism. 
so this is this is kind of uh, at least um, my conception, but uh, me and Jacopo haven't uh, uh, hashed it yeah. out fully yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, please, that's right. Yes, uh, but uh, I think I would agree with Professor Sina that uh, in, in the end, we cannot define the subject. In the end, we have to treat uh, liberalism as the socialist treated it. And um, so it's um, it, it's incoherent because it's served every day, every time a different purpose. So I think uh, uh, we, leave, uh, we leave definition to philosophers. Yeah, and for me, the, the definition is not of what liberalism is, it's more of uh, how we are treating the relationship with liberalism. That's, a, that's what I mean for, for definition. And perhaps I can, I can add, I also agree that when I listen to the other papers, mine is a bit <laughs> eccentric, so it will take a, a kind of a, of introduction and a definition of a, why uh, uh, why I'm also together with you. The, the, though uh, perhaps I should have underlined further that Knut Vixell is quite important for the Swedish Social Democrats. So, so, it's, so, so, it's, so, it's, so it's not only, you, you know, one intellectuals that, that I found that, 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 that is around. He, he, is, he, he is actually a key figure for the early Social the Democratic economic thinking. So, so I, I, I do think that there is a direct re relevance for him as well, but, but I do agree that I didn't put it clearly forward in the paper or, or, or in the presentation. Yeah, there will be so many things to say about consideration we are doing, we are having now, but I think that the, the time is finished for us. And so uh, as fin uh, let me thanks. First of all, Professor Osina for his comments and also my colleagues that this accepted to present here and for people who are here to hearing us. And Marco, first of all, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> grazie, grazie a tutti. Interrompo la registrazione.